Today we're going to talk a little bit about this guy named Jesus. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. You heard of him? Yes. What are some things you guys, when, the, when you think of Jesus, what are some first things you think of? Salvation. Bold. Bold. Come on, come on. Salvation. Conviction. Conviction. The Son of God. What else? Sacrifice. What's that? Strength. Strength. Sacrifice. When we think of Jesus, a lot of things that come into our head. You know, have you guys seen the new Aladdin movie? Yes. I haven't. But let me tell you this, Jesus is not a genie in a bottle where you can rub the little bottle and get three wishes. Jesus wants a relationship with you. He doesn't want you just to pray to him and try to get what you want. Jesus, when he comes, he does something radical. He calls the people to make a decision about following him. And today, I want to challenge each of you to make a decision about following Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. I don't care if you're already a member of the church. I don't care if you've been committed to some church for 25 years. It doesn't matter. I want you to understand who Jesus really is today. Amen? Amen. So turn with me to Mark chapter 1. Come on, Matt. Let's go, bro. Mark chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 1. It says, The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert. Prepare the way for the Lord and make straight paths for him. And so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So this was prophesied about that a guy would come before Jesus to pave the way. And he wasn't a really nice guy. He was a pretty radical, crazy dude. Let's read about it. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. And he ate yummy, delicious locust and wild honey. Oh, yeah. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I. The thongs of his sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. Do you see the respect that John the Baptist had for Jesus? I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So John came to pave the way. John was baptizing, and you could not be baptized by John unless you repented. Matter of fact, you came to him and you didn't want to repent. He said, who are you? Get away from me. And he would call him out. Today I want to ask you, have you really repented of the sin in your life? Has the garbage that you've been living in, have you put it behind you? Or is it something you're still playing with today? See, if you really want a relationship with Jesus, you can't play games with sin. Even the guy who came before him, who wasn't as powerful as him, said, No way! It is time to repent and get right with God. Amen? Amen. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. So even Jesus had to come and be baptized. Amen? Amen. As he was come up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. You are my Son, whom I love with you. I am well pleased. At once, the Spirit sent him out into the desert. And he was in the desert 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended him. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I thought about getting baptized. I thought, wow, yeah, everyone should do that, right? I, thought, I saw it in the Bible. Some preacher talked about it. So I thought of baptism like this little fairy tale. You know, a magic carpet ride. You get on the little magic carpet and everything's wonderful and easy after that. Woo! And you just kind of float on into heaven, right? And yet, Jesus gets baptized. Jesus gets baptized. And then it's not a magic carpet ride. The first thing the Spirit does is say, hey, come with me out into the desert for 40 days while you're going to be tempted by Satan. That's what happened to Jesus after he was baptized. You know what Jesus says? Come follow me. So when you make a decision to get baptized, first of all, you have to repent. Secondly, once you repent, it's not a magic carpet ride. It's a challenge. Yeah. you got to give up everything. Satan's going to come after you to take you out. He wants to ruin your relationship with God. And you've got to make a decision, like John called us to, to stick to that heart of repentance and really walk with God. You've got to understand that you're going to go through some trials, some struggles. It's not a fairy tale. But let me tell you something. It's an adventure. I was talking to one of the brothers yesterday. I won't mention his name, but it was Isaac. And he was saying how the last couple of weeks has been challenging. I put a lot of extra responsibility on Isaac. And he's like, whoa, bro, this has been kind of rugged. But there was that little sense of that little smirk he had. Like, he's kind of like, it's kind of rough, but I kind of like it, you know? You ever done that? You're kind of in the middle of something kind of tough. You go, you know what, though? I kind of, kind of like this. And I was like, bro, let me tell you something. It might get a little bit worse. It might get a little bit harder. 
Right now, this young man is training to be an evangelist in the kingdom of God. That's not an easy thing to do. you got to follow radical, crazy guys that eat locusts. Amen? At least I have better clothes than John. Well, sort of, but anyway. But let me tell you something. You've seen the change in this young man. You've seen how much he's taken on more responsibility. I'll tell you right now, in case you don't know, he's not perfect. I, I know it's hard to believe. He struggles, he wrestles, he fights. If you don't mind me saying what happened. So yesterday, or the day before, Isaac was realizing the responsibility of not just being a disciple, but actually leading other people, which all disciples should do, right? Yeah. If you're a disciple, you follow Jesus. Jesus was a leader, so what should you be? Leader. Exactly. We should lead other people. Lead them to do what? Lead them to have a great relationship with God. Lead them to overcome their sin and repent and be awesome for God. And realizing these responsibilities, it started hitting Isaac how much he needed to grow. And it just hit him. So he went home that night, and he just sat in his bed, and he just wept. It's like, man, i got to grow. I've got to change. God, help me. You know, he's kind of an emotional guy, not like me. But, but Isaac wept. And you know what's funny? The next day he got up. He had an awesome time. He went to the ICCM class. He had studied his brains out. I think he did okay on the exam, right? Yeah, he did all right, all right. We'll keep working on that. But I want to ask you. When you think of being baptized and then living the life of a disciple, were you expecting a fairy tale? Were you expected to rug the magic lamp and out comes a genie and give you whatever you want? Or were you really understanding what it meant that you need to repent, not just once, but repent of your sin and then every day, when you sin again, because it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Even Helen sins. I know. It is, I know. It's hard to imagine. But the thing I love about my wife, there's many things I love about her, but the thing I love about her that's so amazing is whenever Helen has a struggle or a temptation or a sin, this woman is radical about repentance. She goes after. She prays her heart out. And you know what's awesome? She prays before she comes and talks to me about how she's doing. How about you? Are you looking at other people as an idol and trying to get them to help you have a relationship with God? Guys, all they can do is point you to God. You're the one that has to take responsibility. This is where you go out in the desert and you pray for 40 days if you need to. This is the life of a disciple. You get close to the Lord. You get yourself close to Him by talking to Him, praying to Him, and getting to know Him. And you know what's going to happen? The closer you are to God, the more likely you are to not sin. So how's it going with the sin? Honestly. Can I just say some things? Selfishness is a sin. Greed is a sin. Arrogance and pride is a sin, and it offends God. Immorality is a sin. Well, what's immorality? Immorality, you know, it's all, no, no, no. Here's what immorality is. Any kind of sex outside of marriage is a sin. It's immoral. How are you really doing? Well, I don't do that. I just look at pornography. No, no, no. That's a sin. You're lusting in your heart. Jesus says that's like committing adultery. It is sin. How's it really going with repentance? Today, we're going to take communion together. I do not want you to take communion. If you haven't made a decision, I'm going to repent. I'm going to change this. And guys, guys, let me tell you something. You can't fix yourself. You can come to God and repent and ask for the strength, and then He'll forgive you and work with you. Thank God, right? Otherwise, we'd all be like toast. But He's willing to work with us. He's willing to help us. But you've got to make a decision to really follow the Jesus of the Bible, not some phony baloney good time Jesus that doesn't exist but the Jesus of the Bible that calls you to repent. You know what's amazing about people who repent? They're happy people. People who don't repent, look in the mirror. I just want you to do something this week. When you sin, not if, but when you sin this week, I want you to just walk in the bathroom and look in the mirror and go, oh, man, and look at that thing and go, what happened now? Look at your face and look what you're doing. Look, look how you're really feeling. Are you with me here? And remember that ugly mug the next time you're tempted, I go, I am not doing that again. I want to rejoice in God. I want to love my life. Jesus says, I have come to give them life and life to the full. That's the kind of life that I want. But a life to the full does not mean an easy life where everything goes your way. When people expect Christianity to be an easy life where everything goes their way, they get bitter very quickly because things will not go your way. Matter of fact, the first thing that Jesus was told to do after he was baptized was go into the desert. How are you doing? How was your week? Were you in a desert? 
I've been a lot of times I've been in a desert spiritually trying to figure out what to do. The Bible says, Spirit sent him out to the desert. He was in the desert 40 days being tempted by Satan. We will be tempted by Satan, and we need to stand up to the trial. We need to overcome. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. Do you realize that God sends angels to help encourage you and protect you and fight for you? But when you distance yourself from him by remaining in sin, that protection gets pulled back, and he'll let you go through it. I want to challenge you to stay close to the Lord. Look at verse 14. There's some things that Jesus calls the guys and the girls who want to follow him to become or to do. We're going out, you know, you go to the beach, you got to go on a treasure hunt, right? You ever go on a treasure hunt? I kind of like treasure hunt. You search for treasure, you find it. How do you feel? Yeah, it's like a penny, you know, I found a penny. But there's something about finding treasure. So we're going to look for, there's five things in here that Jesus calls these guys to do if they want to follow him. Either you got to do it or you got to become it. So we're going to read this and I want you guys to help me figure out what the five things are. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. What's the first thing that Jesus says they need to find, they need to become, need to do? Repent. Repent. Wow, it's the same message that John the Baptist preached, isn't it? The first thing you have to do, if you want to get close to God, the first thing you got to do is, you know what, i got to stop doing that stuff. i got to quit that. That's a garbage life. I'm going to change. That's the first thing. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus and follow him, that's the first thing. So again, if you're a member of this congregation or whether you're visiting, I want to challenge you. The message doesn't change whether you're a member of this church or not. The message is the same. You must repent. Are you with me here? Matter of fact, Jesus throws in there, hey, the kingdom is near. Well, see, we know that in Acts chapter 2, the kingdom came on earth. So it's no longer near. It is here. here. <laughs> the kingdom is here. So you need to repent. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, don't play games with him. Repent. It doesn't mean you're not going to fail. You're going to fail. Fail forward and then get up and repent. Are you guys with me here? That's the first thing. So you just found one treasure. You can hold on to that treasure for the rest of your life. One of the coolest things that God allows us to do is have the right and the privilege to repent. It is a gift. It is a treasure. You need to value and understand how precious it is. The truth is, one sin, and what could he do to us if he wanted? Just wipe us out. One sin, he has the right to wipe us out. But he gives us the privilege. He gives us the honor to be able to repent. Are you guys with me here? Let's keep reading. Repent for the kingdom of, excuse me, repent and believe the good news. What's the second treasure? Believe the good news. How does one believe the good news? Guys, help me out. You got to go after it. What do you have to do to believe the good news? You got to hear it. If you don't hear the good news, you can't believe it. A lot of people claim to be Christians. and They open this thing about twice a year, Christmas and Easter. You call those guys Christers. They show up on Christmas and they show up on Easter. Christer. That's not a Christian. They don't know where their Bible is. Like, dang, where's my Bible? And then they find it, they got to kind of dust the dirt off of it. If you don't get into the Word of God and read it, you will never believe. If you are struggling in your faith, I'll just give you a simple challenge. Read the book of John. It will change your life forever. It will totally transform your thinking. It will make you a different person because you will begin to really believe in the Jesus of the Bible. How's it going? Believing the good news. See, what is the good news? That word in the Greek is eulangelion, or it's a verb and kind of a noun at the same time. The good news, in fact, is Jesus himself. But you can't find out about Jesus. You can hear all kinds of stuff about a Jesus, sort of Jesus, kind of Jesus, if you listen to preachers and don't read your Bible. But if you get into the Word of God and you really study it out and you let it impact your heart and you start putting it into practice, you're going to find that you believe the good news. The good news is Jesus Christ. And when you get to know him, his heart for you is very clear. It's very clear. He wants to save you. He wants to lift you up. He wants to give you strength so that you can live the life that's worthy of the calling of being a Christian so that you can help other people. That's awesome. So how's it going really believing the good news? See, believing isn't just a thought or a feeling. Oh, I believe. Oh, I feel so warm and fuzzy. No, that's not what it is. Belief is to hear the message and then to put it into practice. That's true biblical belief. Oh, no, no, bro, that's different. Belief is in here. No, it's not. See, even the demons believe and shudder. Demons believe. 
Well, how come they're not saved? Because they don't repent. Because they don't change. They don't put the word into practice. Matter of fact, their time is up. They can't. But you and I are still alive. We have a chance. We have hope to believe the good news and put it into practice. Faith without deeds is dead. So guys, I'm going to tell you right now, don't believe phony baloney Christianity that says, oh, you just believe and you'll be saved. That's garbage. That's taking scriptures out of context and twisting the word of God. You don't believe the good news. You believe something. I want to challenge you to get into the book every single day. If you haven't been reading the Bible, I want to give you a simple challenge. Just read the book of John. It'll radically transform your life. Oh, it's so big. It's so long. No, it's not. It's simple. Read one chapter a day. Faith will enter your heart. You will begin to understand. Even those who are disciples and have been around for a long time, when you get serious about reading the Bible, you start changing again. You get that little spark back. You realize that the difficulties, like Isaac shared, they're an adventure. Yeah, it's tough. But it's an adventure. It's an awesome life we've been called to. Let's keep reading here. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. You know, I don't know about you, but I love to fish. Let's go. Come on, I love to fish. Matter of fact, last night I got my grandkids in town, Clark and little baby Kara. And Clark will be two in uh, early June. And uh, we went out on the dock last night, and we were fishing, man. We were fishing. I love a fisherman. And then Helen sends out a message saying, oh, we've lost Clark. <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. She said, we've lost Clark to fish. And I was like, no, no, no. Fishing found Clark. I'm fired up about Clark learning to fish. So I did catch a fish yesterday. Matter of fact, I caught three. But I don't want to boast. Amen. But the first one I caught, I pulled it up and I showed Clark in the window. And he comes running out. And he wanted to touch it. Wow, he came out. <laughs> he came on out and he touched the fish right on the eye. Like, <laughs> I was like, oh, that's a... yeah. that kid's bold. But you know, you got to love a good fisherman. So Jesus found on the side of the Lake of Galilee, he didn't look for the sunbathers. Why didn't he look for the sunbathers? Why did he look for the guys playing in the surf? Because he was looking for workers. So Jesus went to the Sea of Galilee and he goes, okay, let me see, who can I call? Oh, those guys are working. They understand something. They work hard. They go after it. But you know what else is awesome about fishermen? I'm a fisherman. Fishermen love life and fishermen have fun. I bet these guys were so fun. When you read the book of John, you're going to see some of the interactions that these guys had with Jesus. And you go, wow, that looks like awesome fun. I mean, I don't think Jesus was a boring guy. Can you imagine? Oh, Jesus, here comes boring Jesus. Let's follow Jesus, you know. <laughs> Oh, those boring guys with him. Okay, we'll become just like him, a boring church person. No, I really believe the life of a disciple, when you get into the scriptures, is exciting and awesome and fun. If you look at some of the interactions between Jesus and his guys, Jesus had a crazy sense of humor. Some of the things he said sometimes, like, that's awesome. But you got to read between the lines. Are you with me? Then Jesus says to these fishermen, verse 17, come follow me. Come follow me? Well, hang on a second. Where was he going? He was going to the cross. Now, did they know that? They didn't know that, and Jesus didn't tell them. They just saw who he was. They go, wow, this guy's awesome. He's changing things. He's turning things upside down. The whole nation of Israel had lost their way. They lost their faith. They lost their heart. They lost their purpose. They were no longer the hope for the world. And Jesus comes on the scene and heals people teaches the truth, weeds people out that aren't really real Christians. He goes after it. He turns over tables when he sees unrighteousness. He runs off people that aren't really real in their relationship with God. And these guys saw that and they go, man, that's the kind of guy I want to follow. That's the kind of guy I want to be with. Someone that is righteous and calls other people to it. Someone who really honors the name of God. So he looked at these fishermen and he says, guys, I need you to come follow me. Let's go. They snapped to it. They looked up. Look what happens. He said, Jesus said, come follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Now, wait a second. These guys were fishers of? Fish. Jesus says, I'm going to make you fishers of? Fish. Well, you use, to catch fish, you use a net or a pole, right? What did Jesus use? Himself. He was the bait. 
Come follow me. See, when you throw a lure out there and you're reeling in, you're hoping that the fish is going, come on, fish. Come on, fish. Oh, man, you throw it out again. And if you're a good fisherman, you know it's not the first cast, not the second. Maybe it's not the, the 500th cast. Sometimes that 501 cast, you're like, boom, that fish gets that lure. You're like, yes. So Jesus threw the lure out himself. <laughs> He's swimming through there. He's like, hey, guys, come follow me. Come on. And you know what? If you follow me, I'm going to do something. I'm going to make you into something that you're not. I'm going to make you into something that you're not. Right now you're fishing for fish, and that's awesome. But here's the lure. Come follow me, and I'm going to make you into a fisher of men. You know, guys, how many of you guys have caught fish? All right. After you grab the fish, take it off the hook, put it in the ice chest, what do you notice? There's a smell. Oh, man. You know, and if you leave it in there for a little while and you forgot to put ice in there and it's sitting in the hot sun, about six hours later, you open that ice chest, what do you notice? <laughs> what is that? So you know what I've learned? If you catch fish, they die. And then they stink. If you catch men, yeah, they might stink a little. But if they're alive, their life can become the aroma of God that draws other people to Him. So then, as a fisher of men, you become the bait. Wow. But your job is not to catch people for yourself. Amen? That's uh, kind of like a cult or something. Wow. <laughs> I don't have anything to do with that. No, we catch people and go, here's Jesus. And we show them Jesus. Guys, right now, I want to ask you very honestly, have you repented of your sin? Do you truly believe the good news? And I'm talking to members of the church and people visiting. Do you really believe? Well, how do I know? If you're doing what the Bible says, that's when I know. Number three, are you truly following Jesus? Well, what will it cost you to follow Jesus? Everything. everything. But I don't want to give up everything. Then you can't follow Jesus. But, 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 but I want to go to heaven. But you got to give up everything if you want to follow Jesus. See, he went to the cross. He says, come follow me. I'm going to make you into a different person. Because a disciple who's fishing for men now has an eternal purpose. Instead of catching stinky fish, which I love to catch, even when they stink, I don't care. But let me tell you something I like better. Catching men for God. Watching someone study the Bible, come to faith, Start having a belief in Jesus that's real and makes them change. Watch them transform. Watch them start challenging their family. Woo, that gets uncomfortable sometimes. When you really live like a Christian and you say, hey, mom and dad, it's time to be a disciple. Sometimes that doesn't go super great, does it? Hey, boss, I'm not your slave anymore. I'm not going to work on Sundays. I'm going to church. That ruffles some feathers, gets people a little bit uncomfortable. But is it worth it? Is it worth losing a job to follow Jesus Christ? Yeah. See, some of you didn't say anything. What do you want? See, many of us want to follow Jesus, the genie in the bottle. Poof! Dear Jesus, give me a Lamborghini. Dear Jesus, give me $100,000 a year job. And Jesus is like, yeah, thanks. I'm looking for workers who want to do my will. And he'll find someone else. Now what's amazing is, the Bible says if you give up everything you have, He'll take care of you. Yeah. Are you guys with me? Yeah. Well, right then people go, well, at what level? <laughs> at what level will He take care of me? Like 60000 a year? Wow. <laughs> 100000 I don't know the answer to that. It kind of depends on your talent and ability to work. And maybe a little bit of divine intervention. But if you're not willing to give up a job or anything in your life, the truth is you're not willing to be a disciple. And you won't be able to catch men for God. Because they're going to look at your life and go, oh, you're just like all the other co-workers. Oh, well. Sometimes people go, oh, I'm, God, wait, you're a Christian? I'm so surprised. They don't even know. See, that's because you haven't given up your life. You've taken it back. I want to challenge you today to make a decision to really become a fisher of men. When was the last time you just shared your faith with someone and said, hey, let me tell you about what I have in Christ. Amen. Let me tell you about my church. I want to tell you about the friends that I have. I want to tell you about the relationships God's given me. 
you know, when I became part of the church, something that really hit me is that I needed hope in relationships. Every relationship, I'm talking about girls, okay? Every relationship I had was a total disaster. Okay, I actually counted 14 different girls. Total disaster. Ended in flaming explosions of horribleness. So when I came to become a Christian, I go, okay, I believe. I've repented. Okay, I'm following Jesus. Um, but I want something. I want a relationship that really matters. So the first, first couple of years, I said, you know what? I don't want to date anybody. I'm like, I got to work on my relationship with God. And after I worked on my relationship with God, God introduced me to this young lady over here. About 28 and a half years ago. And I remember going, wow, that woman is awesome. And she's a disciple. She loves the Lord more than she loves me. So I'm going to treat her right. And for the first time in my life, first time ever at 27 years old, I, tra I treated her right. There was no impurity. There was no immorality. I never even touched her. And I was amazed that the relationship went better than any other thing I ever had. Where I broke every rule in the book and did all kind of stupid stuff that I, I regret to this day. I wanted a great relationship with people, but I had to make a decision to give up my life. And my life was a life of sin, impurity, immorality, and selfishness. And it was all about Matt. And when it became about God and really following Him and helping other people get to know Him, all of a sudden my relationship with this amazing woman went great. I think everyone here wants a great relationship, don't you? Yeah. Doesn't everyone here want to be married and be happy? Yeah. Want to be hap Do you want to be married and be unhappy? No. no. You want to be married and, and suffer all kind of horribleness? No, nobody. I don't, you know, wake up in the morning, oh, I can't wait to get divorced. No, people don't do that. And yet, if you don't do it God's way, there's about a 50 to 70% chance that it will end horribly for you. But if you'll repent, if you'll believe the good news, if you'll follow Jesus and focus your heart on seeking and saving the lost like Jesus did and really become a fisher of men, you're going to find that all of your relationships change because now your relationships are focused on the eternal, not the temporary, what you can get right now. 27 years ago, we got married, and I love this woman more than ever to this day. Why? I believe God gave me that because I made a decision to change and really become a disciple. I'm so fired up that God's brought us on this adventure we've been on together for all these years. I look forward to 25 more. Amen? You know, a little old, ah, come on, honey. Amen. She'll help me into my, you know, crib or whatever I'm going to I want to talk about changing diapers and all that, but amen. Let's close out here. So we've now found four treasures in following Jesus. Number one is to repent. That's a treasure. It's a gift from God. Number two is to believe the good news. It is a treasure and a gift from God. Number three is to come follow Jesus, but really follow him, not pretend to follow him. Okay? And number four is to become something different, to become a fisher of men. If you're not fishing for men, you are not a disciple of Jesus, period. Wow. Many preachers will lie to you. Say, oh, no, it's okay. Share your faith later when you feel like it. Baloney. False teaching. Garbage. Jesus was fishing for men from the day he showed up till the day he died. And even after he rose again, he's still fishing for men. Yeah. So if you're not fishing for men, you don't love the Lord. I got kind of quiet. It's time for us to take seriously the call of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus loved the lost. How is it that you got saved? Because he loved you and he had called someone to go talk to you so that you can be a different person. Are you guys really going after making disciples of other men and women? See, I believe that a happy disciple is one who is seeking and saving the lost. An unhappy disciple is all about himself, and he's this close to leaving the Lord and falling away. Today I want to call you to make a decision to become someone who fishes for men. Amen? And lastly, the fifth treasure is this, verse 18. At once they left their nets and followed him. That's a treasure. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. They left their nets 
Yeah, look what it says. When they had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Jebedee, Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Wow! They left everything. Matter of fact, they dropped the nets. They just dropped the nets, and they go, bye, Dad. And they start following Jesus. Dad's like, what are you idiots doing? Got the family business over here. We're fishermen. Get back over here. Like, no, Dad, we're following Jesus. We're going to change our lives. We're fishing for men. They gave up everything. The fifth treasure is to give up everything and give it up right now. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus and stay faithful and really love the adventure of being a disciple through the struggles, through the hardship, you need to give up everything you have. You know, it's interesting. What can you take from somebody who has nothing? Nothing. You can't take anything from me. I've already given it all up. I got nothing to lose. You know, uh, when a guy's got nothing to lose, whoo, life gets pretty exciting. Oh, yeah. Nothing else matters except what you're living for. Yeah. That's it. So today I want to ask you, have you found these treasures in your relationship with God? And if you haven't, are you willing to look until you find them? So again, what are the treasures? Number one, repent. Number two, believe the good news. Number three, follow Jesus. Number four, become a fisher of men. And number five, do it right now and give up everything for the sake of the gospel. Amen? Amen. Right now, we're going to take communion together. And I do want you to search your hearts and ask, if I fumbled in any of these areas, or maybe I haven't done any of them, I want to ask you to make a decision to repent, to talk to God about it, to apologize, and say, you know what, I'll do whatever it takes. If you're visiting today and you haven't done that, you haven't made those decisions, I want to ask you to make a decision to study the Bible with the person you came with. Just sit down and look at the scriptures together. You're going to find they're going to help you, they're going to encourage you, and believe it or not, they're even going to like you and love you. We're a pretty loving church here. I love this group. I'm so blown away by the love in this group. If you don't know, as a matter of fact, the last couple of months we've been raising money for world missions to send out to the third world, to our missionaries. This group right here, raised $157,411. Why? Because they love the Lord, but they love the people that we're reaching out to. I'm blown away by these people. So if you're visiting and you don't have this kind of relationship with God, I want to ask you to study the Bible today, right here in the park. Sit down under a tree, eat some of this awesome food over here, and study the Bible. Amen? If you're a member of the church and you've been struggling in one of those areas and you haven't treasured these things like you should, I want to challenge you to make a decision to repent, turn this thing upside down, renew your relationship with God, and really have a great heart for Him today. Guys, we need to enjoy the sun and the beach today. We have a little bit of fun. We're going to take communion together and then we're going to eat some lunch. But I really want to encourage you to understand who the Jesus is of the Bible and follow Him with all of your heart. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. We'll take communion together. Father God, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for literally dying in our place. Taking our place so that we don't have to die on a cross. Father, I pray that we'd remember that as we take the bread. We remember how much Jesus suffered for us, what he went through, breaking his body, willing to do anything to save us. And God, I pray that we'd remember the blood. Our faith in the blood forgives us of our sin, Father. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for taking care of us. Please forgive us of our sin. Help us to be radical in our repentance today and really get close to you, Father, and have a heart to walk with you again. Thank you for this time of communion. Please bless it in Jesus' name. Amen.